Section 99 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Newgate. Yes, twas two o'clock in the morning, and the hour was proclaimed by the iron tongues of time from the thousand steeples of the mighty metropolis. How solemnly does the sound of those deep sonorous metallic notes break upon the dead silence of that period when darkness spreads its sable wing over an entire hemisphere. And though it is the time for rest, yet repose and slumber are not the companions of every couch. Crime, sickness and sorrow close not their lids in balmy sleep, weighed down with weariness though they be. Too much happiness has likewise an excitement hostile to the serenity of the pillow. For sleep is a fickle goddess, who succumbs not to every one's wooing at the hour when her yielding is most desired. Now coy and coquettish, she hovers around, yet approaches not quite close. Now sternly and inexorably obstinate, she keeps herself at a great distance, in sullen mood. And when the iron tongues of time proclaim the hour of two, were the eyes of the wretched Torrens or his miserable guilty wife closed in slumber? No, no, beneath the same roof, though in compartments far asunder, they writhed and tossed upon their hard pallets, in feverish excitement, craving, longing for sleep to visit them, and sleep would not. In those hours of wakefulness, and amidst the solemn stillness and utter darkness of the night, how terrible are the trains of thought which pass in rapid procession through the guilty mind! As if imagination itself were being hurried along an endless avenue of horrors, grim spectres, hideous phantoms, and appalling sights on the one hand and on the other. Then with what tremendous speed does memory travel back through the vista of a misspent life, all the foul deeds of which become personified in frightful shapes, and muster themselves in terrible array on either side. In his narrow stone cell, the wretched Torrens felt as if he were in a coffin, suffocated, hemmed in around, and yet his imagination possessed boundless space wherein to raise up the awful shapes that haunted his pillow. Was it possible that he was there, in Newgate? Did he dream? Was he the sport of a hideous fantasy? Could it be true that he was dragged away from his comfortable home, snatched, as it were, suddenly from the world itself, and flung into a felon's dungeon? No, no, it was impossible, absurd. Ha, ha, the folly of the idea was enough to make one laugh. But, oh, merciful heavens! He extended his arms, and his hands touched the cold, rugged, uneven wall. Thence they wandered to the iron of the bedstead, and came in contact with the coarse horsecloth which covered his burning, feverish limbs. Then a dreadful groan burst from him, a groan which, even were he ten thousand thousand times more guilty than he really was, would have been lamentable, heart-rending to hear. A groan of such ineffable anguish that Satan himself might have said, This man has suffered enough suffered holy god how deeply deeply has he suffered since the massive door of that mighty stone sepulchre first closed upon him appearing to shut out the pure air of heaven the golden light of day and to mark a point where even human sympathies could follow no farther suffered the wretched felon whose foot is upon the first step of the scaffold never suffered more than the crushed, ruined, accused Torrens. For all his guilt had arisen from the lack of moral courage to meet misfortune face to face. And now that misfortune had thrust itself upon him and compelled him to gaze on its pale and death-like countenance, 
he was completely weighed down. His infamy in respect to Rosamond lay as heavily upon his conscience as would have lain the crime of murder, had he really perpetrated it, and he suffered more on account of the deed which he had committed, but for which the law had not touched him, than on account of the charge of which he was innocent, but for which the law had seized upon him. Miserable, miserable man! Darkness, silence, and sleeplessness were indeed terrible to him, so terrible that, as he lay tossing upon his feverish pallet, he wished that he was dead. Yet, had he possessed the means of inflicting self-destruction, he would have been afraid to die. He was not placed in a ward along with other prisoners, because the charge against him was so black and terrible, the charge of murder, that he was lodged in a dungeon by himself, a cell that had seen many, many previous occupants, most of whom had gone forth to the scaffold. For in Newgate the possession of a room to oneself, if a room, such a coffin of masonry can be called, is the horrible privilege of him who is accused of murder, and those whose alleged offences are of a less deep dye heard together in common wards, where a fetid atmosphere is the medium of communicating the foulest ideas that words can convey or ears receive. Oh, what a plague spot is that horrible jail, that pandemonium of Newgate, upon the civilization of the metropolis of these realms. Shame, shame, that it should be allowed to exist under the management of an incapable, ignorant, and monstrously corrupt body, the Alderman of London. Shame, shame, that it should be permitted to remain as a frightful abuse of local jurisdiction, just because no statesman has yet been found bold enough to wrest a barbarian charter from an overgrown, bloated, and despicable corporation. The wife, the newly married wife of Mr. Torrance, that woman so well known to our readers by the name of Martha Slingsby, was not lodged by herself, being accused of a crime one degree less heinous than that of murder, she was placed in a ward with several other females, and she also heard the iron tongue of time proclaim the hour of two in the morning, and she also tossed upon a hard, sleepless, and feverish pallet, for she had not even the solace of conscious innocence as an anodyne for her lacerated heart and wounded spirit. She knew that she was guilty of the crime imputed to her, and that knowledge lay upon her soul like a weight of lead. And, oh horror, she was well aware that the black deed of forgery would be indubitably fixed upon her, and the penalty of that deed was death. Yes, death by the hand of the common executioner, an ignominious death upon the scaffold. She knew that almost her very minutes were now numbered, that as the clock struck eight on some Monday morning not very far distant, she must be led forth to die, that after her trial, which was sure to end in her condemnation, she should be consigned to the condemned cell, that from this cell she must proceed through several dark and dismal passages to that door upon whose very threshold would appear the gibbet, black and sinister, that she would have to ascend, or perhaps be carried up the steps to the platform of the horrible machine, that she should see myriads and myriads of human beings crowding around to behold her dying agonies, that she would be placed upon a drop soon to glide away from beneath her feet and leave her suspended in the air, that the few minutes during which she must stand upon that drop while the chaplain said the parting prayer would comprise whole years ay, centuries, of the bitterest, bitterest anguish, that her attentive ear would catch even the sound caused by the finger of the executioner when he touched the bolt of the drop an instant before he pulled it back, and that her soul would be yielded up in the agonies of strangulation. Thus, thus in spite of herself, did the wretched woman's imagination picture in frightful detail the whole of the dreadful ceremony of a violent death. Thus, 
thus did she shadow forth in imagination every feature every minute particular of the appalling ordeal and in imagination also did she now pass through it all as vainly she craved for sleep in the silence and the darkness of the prison ward the dread routine of the whole ceremony assumed an historical exactitude a palpable shape and a frightful reality in her mind terrible terrible was it for her to think upon what she now was and upon what she might have been not a hope was left to her in this world she must be cut off in the meridian of her years she must bid adieu for ever to all the pleasures the enjoyments the delights of society and of life oh for the power oh for the means to avert her maddening harrowing thoughts from the prophetic contemplation of that fatal morning when she must walk forth to the scaffold when the close air of that prison would suddenly change to the fresh breeze of heaven as she stepped forth from the low dark door which the passer-by outside ever beholds with a shudder and when she should raise her eyes to that black and ominous framework with the chain hanging from the cross-beam and her own coffin beneath the drop all this was horrible horrible sufficient to deprive the strongest mind of its reasoning faculties and to paralyse the boldest with excess of terror for oh the reward of crime is dispensed in two ways upon earth by the law and by the criminal's own thoughts and far far more dreadful is the punishment inflicted by the guilty conscience than by the vengeance of outraged justice even the horrors of the scaffold immense tremendous though they must be in the reality are magnified a hundredfold by the terror-stricken imagination from the examples of the wretched man and the guilty woman of whom we have been speaking and on whose heads afflictions and miseries fell with such frightful rapidity and crushing weight from their examples let the reader judge of the folly setting aside the wickedness of crime gold deceitful gold was the will-o'-the-wisp which led them on through the devious ways of iniquity until they suddenly found themselves in newgate for the woman forged for gold and the man sold his daughter's virtue for gold and from the moment when torrens consented to that vile deed everything went worse with him nothing was bettered and the circumstances resulting from that one act combined to overwhelm him with afflictions and even to fix upon him a horrible charge of which he was really innocent to err then is to be foolish as well as wicked and this grand truth has doubtless been felt and acknowledged when too late by many and many a wretched being within those very walls and that sombre enclosure of newgate newgate what numberless ties have been severed on its threshold and what countless thousands of individuals on entering that dread portal one by one have gnashed their teeth with rage at the folly even though they have felt no compunction for the guilt of the career which they pursued and which had its natural ending there it was ten o'clock in the morning when a hackney coach stopped at the door of the governor's house which stands in the centre of the front part of newgate and a fine tall handsome young man having leapt forth assisted a closely veiled lady to alight from the vehicle they were almost immediately admitted into the office of the governor the young lady clinging to her companion's arm for support for she was labouring under the most dreadful mental anguish these persons were clarence villiers and his beauteous bride adele returning from devonshire whither they had been to pass the honeymoon they heard on the road ere they reached the metropolis the astounding intelligence that the aunt of the one had been committed to newgate on a charge of forgery and that the father of the other was consigned to the same place under an accusation of the murder of sir henry courtenay they also learnt at the same moment and for the first time that the wretched pair had only just been united in matrimonial bonds when this fearful fate overtook them 
but they were too much shocked by the more grave and serious portion of the tidings which thus burst upon them to give themselves even leisure to express their surprise at the less important incident of the marriage of mr torrens and mrs slingsby they had arrived in london on the preceding evening and had repaired direct to torrens cottage hoping and indeed expecting as a matter of course to find rosamond there but they were disappointed cruelly disappointed in that anticipation the female servant and the lad were however still at the cottage and from the former they learnt tidings which enhanced if possible the grief that already rent the heart of adelais and which excited vague but terrible suspicions in the mind of clarence for the servant informed them that miss rosamond went to stay with mrs slingsby almost immediately after the wedding that she remained there almost ten days and came home the very night when the murder was committed and seemed dreadfully unhappy during the short time that she did remain at the cottage and that she departed no one knew whither the second day after her return leaving a note for her father while adelais sat weeping at these tidings to her so completely inexplicable a torrent of suspicions and terrible ideas rolled through the mind of her husband clarence for he knew as the reader will remember that sir henry courtenay was not only the paramour of his aunt but that he had likewise cast lustful looks upon rosamond and he was equally aware that the young girl's imagination had been excited and inflamed by the false representations his aunt had made in respect to the character of the baronet then that second visit of rosamond to old burlington street her unhappiness on returning home the assassination of sir henry courtenay at torrens cottage the sudden marriage of two persons who were almost entire strangers to each other and the contemporaneous flight of rosamond from her home all these incidents seemed of so suspicious and terribly mysterious a nature as to strike clarence with dismay the version which mr torrens had given rosamond of the particulars of the murder and which as the reader is aware was the true one so far as the actual perpetration of the deed itself was concerned was unknown to clarence inasmuch as it had not been published in the newspapers for when arrested by dykes and bingham mr torrens had immediately sent for able counsel to whom he told his story previously to the examination before the magistrate and by the advice of his legal assistant the prisoner had contented himself by simply declaring his innocence stating that he should reserve for his defence the explanations whereon that assertion was founded thus clarence villiers could not help believing that torrance was really guilty of the murder and he shuddered at the idea which forced itself upon him that his aunt was an accomplice in the crime in fact it naturally appeared as if that woman and that man had suddenly blended their congenial spirits for the purpose of working out deeds of the blackest dye and he dreaded lest the honour of rosamond had been wrecked in the frightful convulsion produced by that association but none of his awful misgivings did he impart to adelais on the contrary he strove to console her by assurances of his hope that her father must be the victim of a terrible junction of adverse circumstances and that his innocence would yet transpire such ideas he was in reality very far from entertaining but it cut him to the quick to behold the anguish of his young wife and he uttered everything of a consolatory nature which his imagination was likely in such a case to suggest as a means of imparting hope and affording comfort they remained at the cottage that night and on the ensuing morning repaired to newgate as we have already stated the governor upon learning the degree of relationship in which mrs villiers stood towards mr torrens expressed himself in terms of the kindest sympathy and offered to proceed in the first instance to the prisoner's cell to prepare him for the meeting with his daughter and son-in-law this proposal was thankfully accepted and the governor after remaining absent for about ten minutes returned to conduct the young couple into the presence of the prisoner with whom he left them 
Adelie threw herself into her father's arms, embraced him with a fondness that was almost wild and frantic, and sobbed bitterly upon his breast, while Clarence Villiers stood a deeply affected spectator of the sad, the touching scene. "'My child, my dear child!' exclaimed the father, more moved by paternal tenderness than he ever yet had been. "'I am innocent! I am innocent!' "'Almighty God be thanked for that assurance!' murmured Adelaide, as she fell upon her knees, and bent her burning face over her father's emaciated hands. For Mr. Torrance had become frightfully thin, altered, and careworn, and his entire appearance denoted how acute his mental sufferings had been. "'Clarence!' he cried, after a few moments' pause, during which he raised his daughter and placed her upon a seat. "'Clarence, did you hear my declaration? I am innocent.' "'I heard it, and I rejoice unfeignedly, oh, most unfeignedly,' returned the young man, not knowing what to think but speaking thus to console his heart-wrung wife. "'But whether I can prove my innocence, whether I can triumph over the awful weight of circumstantial evidence which has accumulated against me,' continued Mr. Torrance, "'is a point which God alone can determine.' An ejaculation of despair burst from the lips of Adelaide. "'For heaven's sake, compose yourself, dearest,' said Villiers. You have heard your father declare his innocence. Yes, yes, she cried. But if the world will not believe him, it is not sufficient that we should be convinced of that innocence. Oh, my God, wherefore has this terrible affliction fallen upon us? Then, suddenly struck by another idea, she exclaimed, And Rosamond, dear father, what has become of my sister Rosamond? Mr. Torrance turned away and burst into tears, for that question revived a thousand agonizing reminiscences in his mind. "'My father here! My sister gone!' mused Adelaide, her manner suddenly becoming strangely subdued, and the wild intensity of her earnest eyes changing in a moment to an expression of idiotic vacancy. "'And Clarence? Where is he?' Methought he was with me just now. "'Merciful God! Her senses are leaving her!' exclaimed Villiers, in a frantic tone. Then, throwing his arms around her, he said, "'Adelaide, my beloved Adelaide, Clarence is here, by your side. Oh, look not at me so strangely, Adelaide. Do you not know me? Speak, speak! I am Clarence, your husband, he who loves, who adores you. My God!' She does not recognize me. And the young man started back, dashing his right hand with the violence of despair against his forehead, while Adelaide remained motionless in the chair, gazing on him with a kind of vacant wonderment, and the miserable father staggered against the wall for support, murmuring in a tone of ineffable emotion, Great God, where will all this end? But at that moment the heavy bolts were drawn back, the door opened. Adelaide uttered a scream of mingled amazement and delight, and in an instant Rosamond was clasped in her arms. Long and fervent was that embrace on the part of the sisters, nor were Torrance and Clarence Villiers alone the witnesses thereof, for the heavy door of the stone cell had, ere it closed again, given admittance to Esther de Medina. Fortunate for Adelaide was it, that Rosamond appeared at such a moment, a moment when the reason of the young bride was rocking on its throne, and the weight of an idea no heavier than a hair would decide whether it were to be re-established on its seat or overturned for ever. Faint and overcome by the sudden revulsion of feeling produced by this sudden meeting with her sister, Adelaide slowly disengaged herself from Rosamond's arms, and falling back in the chair, beckoned Clarence towards her, saying, "'My dear husband, keep near me, stay with me, for I know not what dreadful ideas have been passing in my mind, and it seemed to me for a time that I was in utter darkness, or that I was buried in a profound sleep.' "'But you are better now, dearest,' exclaimed Clarence, overjoyed at this sudden return of her senses. 
"'Yes, I am better now,' said Adelaide, and falling upon her husband's neck, she burst into a flood of tears. Meantime, Rosamond was weeping also in her father's arms, and the eyes of the generous-hearted, the amiable Esther de Medina, were overflowing at the contemplation of this mournful and touching scene. "'Father, father!' murmured Rosamond, her voice almost suffocated with the sobs which agitated her bosom. "'There is hope, every hope!' "'Hope!' ejaculated Mr. Torrance, catching at the word, as if the halter were already around his neck, and the cry of, "'A reprieve!' had fallen on his ears. "'Hope, did you say?' exclaimed Adelie, now so completely relieved by the issue her pent-up anguish and shocked feelings had found in copious weeping, that all the clearness of her intellect had returned. "'Hush, Rosamond,' said Miss de Medina, advancing towards the group. "'Hush, my dear madam,' she added, turning hastily towards Adelie. "'That word must not be breathed here aloud yet. "'Nevertheless, it is true that there is hope, and every hope, nay, even certainty.' "'Great God, I thank thee!' cried Adelie, clasping her hands together in fervent gratitude, while Mr. Torrance was so overcome by emotions of joy and amazement that he sank upon that prison pallet whereon he had passed a night of such horrible watchfulness. "'I implore you to restrain your feelings as much as possible,' said Esther, speaking in a low and mysterious tone, which made Torrance, Clarence, and Adelie suddenly become all attention and breathless suspense. "'The proofs of your innocence, sir,' she added, looking at the prisoner, "'have been obtained. Nay, give utterance to no ejaculation, but hear me in silence.' Within twenty-four hours from this time, your guiltlessness will be proclaimed to the world. Already are the proofs in the hands of a magistrate, but circumstances, with which I am not myself altogether acquainted, render that delay imperiously necessary. It would, however, have been cruel to have left you in ignorance of this important circumstance, and, and this admirable young lady, at whose father's house I found a home, hastily added Rosamond, would not refuse me the joy, the indescribable joy, of being the bearer of these tidings. Nay, more, she offered to accompany me. "'God will reward you for all your kindness to my sister, dear lady,' said Adelie, embracing Esther with heartfelt gratitude and affection. "'You are doubtless anxious to learn how the proofs of Mr. Torrance's innocence have been obtained,' resumed Esther after a pause. But my explanation must be very brief. Suffice it to say that in this mighty metropolis, which contains so much evil, there is a man bent only on doing good. Accident revealed to him certain particulars which convinced him of your innocence, sir, continued the beautiful Jewess, addressing herself now especially to Mr. Torrance. Upon the information which he thus received, he acted and he has succeeded in obtaining and placing in the hands of a justice of the peace the confession of the real perpetrators of the awful deed. "'Then the murderers are in custody, doubtless?' exclaimed Clarence, astonished and delighted at all he heard. "'They are not in the grasp of justice,' answered Esther. "'But on this head you must ask me no questions.' Rest satisfied with the assurance that the innocence of Mr. Torrance will completely and unquestionably transpire, that he will soon be restored to you all, and that his secret friend watches over him, even from a distance. Who that individual is, you cannot know, and perhaps never may. All the recompense he demands at your hands is a subduing in your minds of every sentiment of curiosity that may prompt you to pierce the mystery which surrounds his actions. And remember also that every syllable I have now uttered is to remain a secret, profoundly locked up in your own breasts, until the proclamation of innocence shall be made from that quarter to which the solemn duty of publishing it has been entrusted. We should be wanting in common gratitude, indeed, to him who has thus interested himself in behalf of the innocent, were we to act in opposition to those injunctions, 
said Clarence Villiers. But through you, lady, do we each and all convey our heartfelt thanks for that generous intervention which is to produce so vitally important a result. Yes, and to you also, dearest Miss de Medina, is our eternal gratitude due, exclaimed Rosamond, an assurance that was immediately and sincerely echoed by Adelie, Clarence, and Mr. Torrance. Hope had now returned to that prison cell, hope in all her radiance and her glory, with her smiling countenance and her cheering influence. The name of Mrs. Torrance, late Mrs. Slingsby, was not mentioned by a soul during this meeting. Her husband uttered it not. Clarence, through motives of delicacy, remained silent likewise in that respect, and the sisters had too much to occupy their thoughts relative to their father's position and the hope of his speedy release to devote a moment's attention to that woman. For the interview was necessarily short, in consequence of the severity of the prison regulations. But when Mr. Torrance was again alone in his cell, he could scarcely believe that so sudden a change had taken place in his prospects. On leaving the jail, after having taken a tender and affectionate leave of their father, the sisters looked inquiringly at each other, as if to ask whither each was going. "'We have taken up our abode at the cottage,' said Adelaide, breaking silence. "'Where we shall remain, doubtless,' she added, glancing towards her husband, "'until our father shall be restored to us.' Clarence signified his assent. "'I should be grieved to separate you from your sister immediately after your unexpected meeting to-day,' said Esther, addressing herself to Adelaide. "'But if Rosamond will continue to make our house her home—' "'Yes, yes, my dear friend,' exclaimed Rosamond hastily. "'I will intrude a little longer upon your hospitality, "'for I feel that my nerves have been too much shaken by recent occurrences "'to allow me to return to the cottage, at least for the present.' "'The reader need scarcely be informed that the young lady desired to avoid "'the painful prospect of being alone with her sister and Clarence. "'For what explanation could she give of her flight from home?' an explanation which she knew would naturally be required of her. Adelaide, indeed, felt somewhat hurt at the decision which her sister had made in respect to remaining with Miss de Medina, but she concealed her vexation, and they parted with an affectionate embrace. Thus Clarence and Adelaide proceeded to Torrance Cottage, while Esther and Rosamond returned in Mr. de Medina's carriage to Finchley Manor, during their ride home in the hackney coach, Villiers and his wife discussed all the incidents which had just occurred. But during a pause in the conversation, Adelaide bethought herself for the first time that day of her mother-in-law. Clarence, she said, laying her hand upon her husband's arm, we have been sadly culpable. I know to what you would allude, dearest, interrupted Villiers. "'Tomorrow I shall call upon my wretched aunt, "'but it is by no means necessary for you to accompany me. "'Your father did not once mention her name during the interview. "'We will not seek to penetrate his motives for that silence, "'but we will endeavour to imitate him in that respect as much as possible.' "'I do not clearly understand you, Clarence,' said Adelaide, "'gazing at him inquiringly. I mean that the less we speak concerning my aunt, the more prudent it will be, my love, responded Villiers, for I fear that she will not prove to be innocent of the crime imputed to her. And under all circumstances, you can owe her no sympathy nor respect, either as my relative or your mother-in-law. Adelaide made no answer, and Clarence immediately changed the conversation. End of section 99 Section 100 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Martin Stout The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds The Stout House 
London is a wondrous city for the success with which the most flagrant quackery is accomplished. Things not only improbable, but absolutely impossible, are puffed off with matchless impudence. And what is more extraordinary still, they obtain an infinite number of believers. Thus we have snuffs which will cure blindness when the most skilful oculists are at fault. Oils and pomatums that will make the hair grow in spite of nature's denial. Cosmetics that will render every skin, though tawny as a gypsy's, white as a Circassian's. Pills so happily compounded as to be a universal panacea, annihilating diseases of even the most opposite characters, and effecting for thirteen pence halfpenny what all the College of Physicians could not accomplish for millions. Lozenges, by which a voice cracked like a tin trumpet, may become melodious as a silver bell. Ointments that will cure in a week ulcers and sores which have baffled all the experience of famous hospital surgeons for a quarter of a century. Decoctions prepared on purpose to prolong life, although the elixir vitae of the alchemists has long been regarded as an absurd fable. Boluses competent to restore to all their pristine vigour, constitution shattered by years and years of dissipation and dissolute habits. Pulmonic wafers efficient to wrestle against the very last stage of consumption and restore lungs entirely eaten away. Tonics so wonderful that they will even give new coats to the stomach, though the old ones have been destroyed by ardent spirits. And heaven only knows how many more blessings of the same kind. Seriously speaking, it is deplorable to perceive how tremendously the millions are gulled by all these details of an impudent and most dishonest quackery. The coiner who passes off a base shilling, representing it to be a good one, is punished as a felon and stigmatised as a villain. But the quack who sells articles with which he announces to be capable of performing physical impossibilities is not tangible by the law, nor does he become branded in the opinion of the world. Such are the conventional differences existing in civilised society. Of all the demoralising species of quackery practised nowadays, certain medical works are decidedly the worst. We allude to those beastly things which are constantly announced in the advertisement department of newspapers, but which, with a scintillation of good taste on the side of the printers, are invariably huddled together in the most obscure nook. It is evident that newspaper proprietors are ashamed of the filthy advertisements, although they cannot very well refuse to insert them. But we warn all our readers against suffering themselves to put the least confidence in the representations set forth in the announcements alluded to. The works thus puffed off are contemptible as regards medical information, demoralising in their very nature and delusive in all their promises. An amusing species of quackery exists with respect to many public houses. Passing along a thoroughfare or visiting some fresh neighbourhood springing up in the outskirts of the metropolis, you will probably see a new building destined for the public line and with the words Noted Stout House painted on a board or cut in the masonry. The cool impudence of proclaiming an establishment to be famous for a particular article before it is even finished is too ludicrous to provoke serious vituperation. The merit of the place is agreed upon beforehand between the architect and the proprietor. Never mind how worthless the beer to be retailed there may eventually prove. It is a noted stout house all the same. But so accustomed are the inhabitants of London to behold such things that the springing up of such a structure causes no sensation in its neighbourhood good, easy people that we are nowadays, we take everything for granted, and as a matter of course. The noted stout house in Helmet Row St Luke's, called by its patrons for abbreviation's sake, The Stout House, was one of those flash boozing kens which are to be found in low neighbourhoods, and noted it indeed was. Not on account of its beer, unless the fame thereof consisted of its execrable nature, but by reason of the characters frequenting it. The parlour was large, low and dark, and in the evening it was invariably filled with a miscellaneous company of both sexes. Prostitutes and thieves, old procuresses and housebreakers, dissolute married women and notorious coiners, these were the principal supporters of the Stout House. Had Machiavelli once passed an evening there, he would not have declared as a rule that language was given to man for the purpose of disguising his thoughts inasmuch as no attempt at any such disguise at all was made in that place. Everyone spoke his mind in the most free and open manner possible, calling things by their right names and expressing the filthiest ideas in the plainest phraseology. If foul words were capable of impregnating the air, the atmosphere of the stout house parlour 
would have engendered a pestilence. At about half past nine in the evening, John Jeffreys sauntered into the establishment, took a seat at the table, and gave his order to the waiter for the beverage which he fancied at the moment. Whenever a newcomer appears in a public room of this kind, the company invariably leave off talking for a minute or so to enjoy a good stare at him, and they measure him from head to foot, turn him inside out as it were, and form their rapid and silent conjectures regarding him, just as a broker takes stock in his mind with a hasty survey around on putting an execution for taxes or rates into a defaulter's house. We cannot exactly say what opinion the company present on this occasion at the Stout House formed of John Jeffreys, but we are able to assure our readers that, much as he had seen of London, and well as he was acquainted with its vile dens and low places of resort, he thought to himself, as he glanced about him, that he had never before set eyes on such a dissipated-looking set of women, or such a repulsive assemblage of men. "'Well, and so Mother Oliver's place is broke up at last,' observed one of the females, addressing herself to another woman, and evidently taking up the thread of a conversation which the entrance of Jeffreys had for a few moments interrupted. "'Yes, and the poor old creature has been sent to quad by the beaks at Hicks Hall, till she finds sureties for a good behaviour in future,' was the reply. "'What? Is that the Mother Oliver, you mean, has kept the brothel in Little Sutton Street? To the side of the Goswell Road there?' demanded a man, desisting from his occupation of smoking for a few moments while he asked the question. "'To be sure it is,' returned the female, who had previously spoken. "'And a bad thing it is for me, I can tell you. I was serving there, and a good living it were. But I'll tell you how it all came about.' It was a matter of six or seven weeks ago that a young fellow came to the house, quite of his own accord, as you may suppose, and he stayed there for three whole days, for he was quite struck, as one might say, with a fair-haired gal with which he had been lodging with us for some time. Well, he orders everything of the best, promising to pay all in a lump, and so Mother Oliver gives him tick, like a fool she was, but at last she wanted to see the colour of his money, and then he bullied and swore and kicked up a row and went away without paying a mag. Well, the debt was given up as a bad job, and we thought no more about it, till we heard a few days afterwards that the house was to be indicted. So off Mother Oliver goes to the clerk of the peace. But lo and behold, yea, the young gentleman was a clerk in his office, and not content with regularly robbing the poor old woman, he must try and ruin her into the bargain. Mother Oliver got to see the clerk of the peace and began to tell him all about the trick his young man had played her, but he said he knowed everything already, and she had enticed the young fellow into her house, and that was the reason she was to be indicted. So the thing came on yesterday before the Middlesex magistrates at Hicks Hall and the mother Oliver was sent to jail. There's been a regular rooting out of them kind of cribs all over the parish, observed one of the company, and it's the same in many other parishes. Yes, but I'll tell you what it is, exclaimed the woman who had related the above particulars. It's only against the poor sort of houses that these prosecutions has ever got up. Lord bless you, before I went to mother Oliver's I was servant in a flash brothel at the West End, a regular slap-up place beautifully furnished and frequented by all the first folks. It was kept, and still is kept, by a French woman. I was there as under housemaid for a matter of seven years, and should have been there till now, only I was too fond of taking a drop the first thing in the morning to keep the dust out in the summer and the cold out in the winter. Oh, I dare say as you always was a lushing jade, Sally, observed an individual in his shirt sleeves who seemed to know the woman well. Well, old feller, and what then? cried she for a moment, manifesting a strong inclination to draw her fingernails down the cheeks of her acquaintance. But, calming her anger, she said, "'It don't matter what comes from your lips, "'so I shan't be provoked by you. "'Howsomever, as I was telling you, "'I was servant in the flash house at the West End "'for upward of seven years, "'and such scenes as I saw. "'The old Frenchwoman used to entice "'the most respectable gals there "'by means of advertisements for governesses, "'ladies' maids, and so on, "'and there was kept prisoners "'till they either agreed to what she proposed "'or was forced into it "'by the noblemen and gentlemen frequenting the place.' and all this occurred i can assure you in one of the fashionablest streets in london but there was never no notice taken by the parish authorities and as for the society what's its name again that prosecutes bad houses didn't seem to know there was such a brothel in existence i'll tell you how that was too the french woman gave such general satisfaction to her customers and was always treating them to such novelties in the shape of the gals that she was protected by all the gay noblemen and gentlemen at the west end "'Lord bless you, some of her best customers were the Middlesex magistrates themselves. "'And two or three of the noblemen and gentlemen that I spoke of "'was members of the committee of that very society which prosecutes brothels. "'So it wasn't likely that the house would ever be interfered with. "'I recollect the old Frenchwoman used to laugh and joke with the great lords "'and the members of the commons that patronised her, 
about the way they talked in the Parliament Houses and the bother they made about the better observance of the Sabbath and so on. It used to be rare fun to hear the old lady in her broken English repeating to them some of their fine speeches which she'd read in the papers, and how the gals used to laugh with them, to be sure. You don't mean to say that them lords and members, which is always a going on about the Sabbath, used to frequent the brothel you speak of? exclaimed a man. Don't I, though, cried the woman, in a tone of indignation at the bare suspicion against her veracity implied by the question. I do indeed, my man, and I should think you ought to know the world better than to be astonished by it. It was through having the patronage of all them great people that the old Frenchwoman never got into trouble. But none of the fine brothels at the West End are ever prosecuted. No one would think of such a thing. It's only the low ones in the poor neighbourhoods. Well, I always heard say that poverty is the greatest possible crime in this country, observed the man who had recently spoken, and now I'm convinced on it. I never had any doubt about it, said another. A rich man or a rich woman may do anything, but the poor juice a bit. That's quite another thing. Why, look at all these bishops and great lords and members of the commons which are constantly raving about Sunday travelling. Don't they go about in their carriages? And ain't Hyde Park always more filled with splendid vehicles on a Sunday than any other day? The very bishops which would put down coaches on a Sabbath go in their carriages to the cathedrals where they preach. By all I can hear or learn, observed another individual present, there's a precious sight more religious gammon in the Parliament Houses than anywhere else. Oh, I should think there is too exclaimed the woman who had told them the tale relative to the brothel keepers. Some of them noblemen and gentlemen that I spoke of was the most terrible fellows after the young women that I've ever seen in all my life, and they was always bothering the French woman to send over to France or down into the country to entice more gals into the house. The French woman used to send out agents to entrap innocent creatures whenever she could. Farmers and clergymen's daughters and such like. I remember what a spree we had with one of the religious members of the commons one night. He had been bringing in a bill, or whatever you call it, to protect young females from seduction, and had drawn such a frightful picture of the whole business that he'd made all the other members shed tears. Well, as soon as he'd done, he came straight off to our place and asked the old French woman if she'd got anything new in the house. That very day, a sweet young gal, a poor marine officer's daughter who wanted to be a governess, had been enticed to the brothel, and the member that I'm speaking of gave the old French woman fifty guineas for the purchase of that poor creature. The woman was entering into further details, when Wilton, and another of the retainers of Geoffrey's mysterious master entered the parlour of the Stout House, both disguised as servants out of place. The place was too much crowded to enable them to converse at their ease. They accordingly all three repaired to a private room, Geoffrey's having left at the bar a suitable message to be delivered to Old Death, who was well known at that establishment. Wilton ordered up glasses of spirits and water, and when the waiter had retired after supplying the liquor, Jeffreys proceeded to acquaint his colleagues with the promised tidings relative to Tidmarsh. I called at the Bunces' house in Earl Street, Seven Dars, this morning, he said, and saw Old Death, who was quite delighted when I assured him that I had already found the two friends of whom I had spoken to him, and that they would be here punctual this evening at half-past ten. I then told him that as the resurrection affair in St Luke's churchyard would most likely come off tomorrow night, as I should be engaged the best part of tomorrow on my own business, he had better let Tidmarsh go with me at once and show me the exact spot where Tom Rain was buried. The old man bit directly and said, Well, Jeffreys, you're a faithful and good fellow and can be trusted. Tidmarsh lives here now and is upstairs at this moment. So Tidmarsh was sent for, and away him and me went together to St Luke's. In the course of conversation I found out that Tidmarsh, Bunce and Mrs Bunce, were to go out with Old Death on some business this evening, and that while Old Death came here to meet me, the other three were to wait for him at another flash house in Mitchell Street close by. This is admirable, said Wilton. We have now the whole gang completely in our power. Fortunately, I have several of our master's people in the neighbourhood, and I will go at once and give them the necessary instructions. Wait here, Jeffreys, with Harding, he added, indicating his colleague with a look. Until I return, my absence will not be long. Wilton left the room, Jeffreys and Harding remaining alone together. In a quarter of an hour, the black's trusty dependent returned. All my arrangements are now complete, he said, resuming his seat, and the entire gang must inevitably fall into our hands. Jeffreys then acquainted Wilton and Harding with the exact nature of the proposal, which would be made to them by old death, and scarcely were these preliminaries accomplished when the ancient miscreant made his appearance. This is business-like indeed, very business-like, my good fellow, said old death taking a chair and addressing himself to Jeffreys while he spoke. And these, I suppose, he continued, fixing a scrutinising glance upon the others, are the friends you spoke of? 
"'Just so,' replied Jeffreys. "'This is Bill Jones,' he added, laying his hands on Wilton's shoulder. "'And there's no mistake about him. "'Tyler is named Ned Thompson, and knows a thing or two, I rather suspect.' "'All right, all right,' chuckled Old Death, rubbing his hands joyfully together. "'I'm glad to make your acquaintance, Mr Jones, and yours too, Mr Thompson.' "'And we're not sorry to form yours, Mr Bones,' said Wilton, "'affecting a manner and tone suitable to the part he was playing. "'Our pal Jeffreys here has told us quite enough to make us anxious to know more of you. "'And so you shall, my dear friends,' exclaimed Old Death. "'I can always find business for faithful agents, and I can pay them well likewise.' "'Jeffreys has told us that,' observed Wilton. "'And I have also explained to them what you want done tomorrow night, Mr Bones,' said Jeffreys. "'Good,' ejaculated Old Death. "'Well, is it to be done?' "'There's no manner of difficulty that I can see,' said Harding. "'And as for any risk, why, if the reward's at all decent, "'the reward shall be liberal, very liberal,' interrupted Old Death hastily. "'What what should you say to a ten-pound note apiece?' "'Deuce take it!' cried Wilton, thinking it would look better to haggle at the bargain. "'Remember, there's the chance of transportation, and my friend and I are not so desperate hard up.' "'No, no, I understand,' observed Old Death fearful that his meanness had disgusted his new acquaintances, and they should lose their services unless he immediately manifested a more liberal disposition. I meant ten pounds each on account, and ten pounds more for each when the job is done. Besides, he added, there's other business to follow on. This is only the first scene in the play that I'm going to set up, in which you must be prominent characters. And the aged miscreant chuckled at his attempt at humour. What you have now said, observed Wilton, quite alters the case. Twenty pounds each, and the chance of more work, is a proposal that we can accept. What say you, Thompson? I say what you say, Jones, replied Harding. Now then, we understand each other, my friends, continued Old Death, and I will at once give you the earnest money. Thus speaking, he drew forth a greasy purse and presented the two men, each with ten sovereigns, which they appeared to snatch up with much avidity. I have now nothing more to say to you, resumed Benjamin Bones his fierce eyes sparkling beneath his overhanging brows, with the hope of speedy vengeance on the Earl of Ellingham. You must place yourselves at the disposal of your friend Jeffreys here, who will inform you how to act, and show you precisely in what way my wishes are to be executed. I must now leave you, but tomorrow evening, he added in a tone of savage meaning, I shall see you in Earl Street with the coffin. You may rely upon us, Mr Bones, replied Wilton. But won't you stay and take a glass with us? demanded Jeffreys. "'Not tonight, not tonight,' was the answer. "'I took something short at the bar as I passed by, "'but tomorrow night, my friends, tomorrow night,' he exclaimed emphatically, "'you shall find a good supper ready for you in Earl Street when you come, "'and a drop of the right sort.' "'So much the better,' said Jeffreys. "'I like a good supper, but where's your hurry at present, Mr Bones?' "'To tell you the truth, my dear boy,' answered the old man, "'I've got three friends waiting for me at a ken in Mitchell Street, "'and I promise not to keep them longer than I could help.' So you must excuse me on this occasion, and therefore, good-bye. Old Death shook hands with the three men, and took his departure, chuckling to himself at the idea of having secured the services of Geoffrey's friends at so cheap a rate, inasmuch as he would cheerfully have given them, griping and avaricious as he was, three or four times the sum stipulated, in order to secure their services in the scheme of carrying out his atrocious plans of vengeance. But for once, Old Death, the laugh was against yourself, as you speedily discovered to your cost. We must not, however, anticipate. The moment the old man had left the room, Wilton, Harding and Jeffreys exchanged glances of satisfaction and triumph. Bunce, Tidmarsh and Bunce's wife are all three at the Flash House in Mitchell Street. That is quite clear, said Jeffreys. Yes, observed Wilton, and the moment for action is now at hand. Let us depart. The three men accordingly left the tavern and hastened in the direction which they knew Old Death must pursue in order to reach Mitchell Street. As they passed by another public house in Helmet Row, Wilton bade them pause for a moment, while he went in to give the necessary instructions to the persons who were associated with him in the expedition of this night, and whom he had ordered to remain there until his return. He speedily rejoined Jeffreys and Harding, and all three were once more on the track of old death. At the same time, half a dozen men, dressed as labourers, issued from the public house at which Wilton had called, and dispersing themselves, hurried singly by different ways towards the road, separating the two burial grounds. Precisely at the corner where Mitchell Street joins Helmet Row, and just as he was in the act of turning into the former thoroughfare, Old Death was suddenly seized by three men and gagged before he had time to utter a single exclamation. 
The moon shone brightly and his eyes flashed the fire of savage rage and wild amazement as their glances fell upon the countenances of Wilton, Harding and Jeffreys. He stamped his feet in a paroxysm of fury and then struggled desperately to release himself. But his efforts were altogether unavailing. Though he exerted a strength which could scarcely have been expected on the part of so old and feeble a man, he was borne off to the black's carriage, which was waiting close by, and being thrust in was immediately bound and blindfolded by two persons who were already seated inside the vehicle, which drove away at a rapid rate. This important feat being accomplished, Wilton desired Jeffreys to proceed to the flash house in Mitchell Street, and induced Tidmarsh and the Bunces to accompany him into the ambush prepared for them. Jeffreys accordingly repaired to the boozing ken alluded to, where he found the objects of his search seated at a table, and occupied in the discussion of bread and cheese and porter. "'Sorry to interrupt you, my friends,' said Jeffreys, "'but you must come away with me directly. Mr Bones has sent me to fetch you.' "'Is anything the matter?' asked Mrs Bunce in a low but agitated voice, as she glanced towards the strangers present in the room. "'I can't say what's the matter,' replied Jeffreys, "'cause I don't know. "'But Mr Bones seems much excited, "'and he's walking up and down the road between the burying grounds. "'He told me to desire you to come to him directly.' "'Is he alone there?' inquired Toby Bunce, "'looking particularly frightened. "'Yes, quite alone. "'There's no danger of anything, if that's what you mean. "'But I think Mr Bones has met with some annoyance. "'Come on.' "'Tidmarsh and the Bunces accordingly rose, "'paid for what they had ordered, "'but which they had not had time to finish,' and repaired with Jeffreys to the place mentioned by him. "'Where is Mr Bones?' demanded Mrs Bunce, in a querulous voice. But ere Jeffreys had time to give any answers. His three companions were set upon, and made prisoners by the blacks' retainers. It is only necessary to state in a few words that they were gagged, blindfolded, thrust into a second vehicle which was in attendance, and conveyed to the same place with a Tim the Snammer, Josh Pedler, and Old Death had preceded them. Wilton, Having superintended this last transaction, remained behind along with Jeffreys, to whom he addressed himself in the following manner, as soon as the carriage had departed. I am commissioned by my master, who is also yours, to state to you his entire approval of your conduct. Measures have been taken to save Mr Torrens in a manner which cannot implicate you. Keep your own counsel, be prudent and steady, and you may not only atone for past errors, but become a respected and worthy member of society. For a few days it will be necessary for you to remain as quiet as possible at your own lodgings, and whatever extraordinary reports you may hear concerning the affairs of Mr Torrens, however wonderful the means adopted to proclaim his innocence of the crime of murder may be, keep a still tongue in your head. So much depends upon your implicit secrecy, that you would not be now left at large, did not our master entertain a high opinion of your fidelity. But beware how you act. You have had ample proofs, not only of his power, but likewise of his matchless boldness and unflinching determination in working out his aims. For my own sake, Mr Wilton, said Jeffreys, I shall follow all your advice, and you will live to bless the hour when you first encountered our master, was the answer. It is not probable that your services will be required again for some days, but should it be otherwise, a letter or messenger will be dispatched to your abode. Our master retains in his hands the money that you left with him, and the next time he has occasion to see you, he will advise you in what manner to lay it out to your best advantage. In the meantime, he has sent you a moderate sum, not from your own funds, but from his purse, for your present wants. And so long as you remain in his service, your wages will be liberal, but paid in comparatively small but frequent sums, so that the possession of a large amount may not lead you into follies. By this course he will train your mind to recognise the true value of money, honourably obtained, and fit you for the position in which the funds he holds of yours may shortly place you. Jeffreys and Wilton then separated, the former more astonished than ever at the bold and yet skilfully executed proceedings set on foot by his mysterious master. End of section 100 Recording by Martin Stout Section 101 of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by greg giordano the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds clarence villiers 
and his aunt the church of st sepulchre on snow hill was proclaiming the hour of nine on the following morning when clarence villiers again entered the office of the governor of newgate and solicited permission to see mrs torrens representing the degree of relationship in which he stood with regard to that unhappy woman we have before stated that mrs torrens had been placed in a ward where there were several other prisoners of her own sex and the governor animated by a proper feeling of delicacy and supposing that the interview of relatives under such circumstances was likely to be of a nature which it would be cruel to submit to the gaze of curious strangers immediately conducted clarence into his own parlour whither the guilty aunt was speedily conducted when they were alone together clarence endeavoured to find utterance for a few kind words but his tongue clave to the roof of his mouth and he burst into tears mrs torrens threw herself into a chair covered her face with her hands and expressed the anguish of her soul in deep and convulsing moans oh my dear aunt exclaimed clarence at length in what a frightful position do i find you what terrible changes have a few short days effected do not reproach me clarence oh do not reproach me said the wretched woman extending her arms in an imploring manner towards him i am miserable enough as it is my god i can well believe you cried villiers speaking in a tone of profound commiseration and forgetting for a moment the iniquity of which his aunt had been guilty for she was frightfully altered her plumpness was gone her cheeks were thin and pale and she even stooped as if with premature old age oh yes i am indeed very very miserable she repeated in a tone of intense bitterness and clasping her hands together in the excess of her mental agony such nights as i have passed since i first set foot in this dreadful place no human tongue can tell the amount of wretchedness which i endure in the daytime tis too horrible oh far too horrible to think of but at night when all is dark and silent and when my very thoughts my very ideas seem to spring into life and assume ghastly shapes oh my dear aunt do not allow your imagination thus to obtain dominion over you interrupted clarence endeavour to compose yourself a little if only a little for it does me harm to see you thus besides i have so much to say to you so many questions to ask you so much advice to give you alas the only counsel you can give me clarence said the wretched woman shaking with a cold shudder though the perspiration stood in big drops upon her brow the only counsel you can give me clarence is to bid me prepare for another world is it possible cried villiers shocked by the appalling significance of these words have you no hope no chance would you believe me were i to assure you that i am not guilty of the crime imputed to me the forgery of a draft upon the bankers of the late sir henry courtenay demanded mrs torrens fixing her sunken lustreless eyes upon her nephew no no you are convinced that i am guilty and a jury will pronounce me to be so think not that i am blind myself against all the horrors of my position i know my fate i know that i must die eventually by the hand of the executioner god have mercy upon you exclaimed villiers pressing his hand to his brow as if to calm the dreadful thoughts which his aunt's language excited in his brain yes clarence that must be my fate she continued unless i obtain a short respite of a few months by confessing confessing what cried clarence impatiently oh no not to you can i make that avowal she exclaimed in a shrieking tone but i understand you yes a light breaks in upon me and do not spurn me altogether clarence said the wretched woman throwing herself upon her knees before him and grasping one of his hands with convulsive tightness in both her own oh i know what you would reproach me with if not for my own sake yet for that of the unborn child which i bear in my bosom i should have avoided this awful risk recoiled from that fatal crime but i was so confident of success so certain of avoiding exposure 
and my affairs too are so desperate without resources sir henry courtney having disappeared in such a mysterious manner aunt interrupted clarence in a firm and solemn tone as he raised her from her suppliant posture and placed her in a chair answer me as if you were questioned by your god are your hands unstained with the blood holy heavens would you believe me capable of murder cried mrs torrens in a penetrating thrilling tone of deep anguish listen clarence she continued her voice suddenly becoming low and hollow as she rose also from her seat and laid her emaciated hand upon his arm listen clarence for a few moments i have been of all hypocrites the most vile i have led a dissolute life the profligacy of which has been concealed beneath the mask of religion i have subsisted upon the wages paid to me by a paramour for the use of my person i have forged i have become the accomplice of the ravisher of innocence but a murderess no never never god be thanked for that assurance which i now sincerely believe exclaimed clarence but you speak of being the accomplice of the ravisher of innocence is it possible answer me quickly that rosamond my sister-in-law oh kill me kill me clarence cried the miserable woman again throwing herself at his feet in the anguish of her soul kill me i say for that was the blackest crime which one woman ever perpetrated towards another then all my worst fears are confirmed groaned clarence and turning abruptly away from her in sudden loathing and horror he broke forth into violent ejaculations of rage but in less than a minute the sounds of grief more bitter than his fury was terrible forced themselves on his ears and glancing round he beheld his aunt lying prostrate on the floor her face buried in the carpet and her whole frame convulsed with an anguish which in a moment renewed all the feelings of commiseration in his really generous heart springing towards the spot where she had fallen when he burst so rudely away from her he raised the wretched creature in his arms conveyed her once more to a seat and endeavoured to address her in terms of consolation and kindness he even implored her pardon for what he termed his brutality towards her oh you have no forgiveness to ask of me clarence she murmured in a faint and half suffocating tone your indignation is most natural and i am the vilest being in female shape that ever cursed the earth with a baleful presence or brought dishonour on the glorious sex my god when i look back and survey all my crimes all my misdeeds i despair of pardon in another world and now you add another wickedness to those of which you spoke exclaimed clarence for the mercy of god is infinite it must be so it would be an awful sin a monstrous impiety to believe otherwise a great and good being possessing omnipotent power and a will which there is none to question can have no pleasure in casting your soul poor frail crushed down woman into a lake of eternal fires oh believe me there is hope even for greater criminals than yourself but every atonement which it is possible for you to make upon earth must be made and whatever be your fate amongst beings who forgive nothing you will experience the blessings of the salvation at the hands of a being who forgives everything i am penitent oh believe me clarence i am very penitent exclaimed his aunt would to god that i could live the last twenty years of life over again not an error no not even a frailty should stain my soul but these thoughts come upon us when it is too late to take them as the guides of our conduct alas such is indeed the case said clarence mournfully and now aunt i am about to ask you to perform a duty which will perhaps lacerate your bosom revive a thousand bitter reflections i understand you clarence interrupted mrs torrens subduing her emotions as much as possible and speaking in a comparatively tranquil tone you require from my lips a true and faithful narrative of all that has occurred since you left london with your beautiful bride well that narrative shall be given sit down by me and listen but in so listening 
you will only receive fresh proofs of my black turpitude for systematically and coolly not in the excitement of moments when evil passions were more powerful than reason have i perpetrated those crimes which now weigh so heavily upon my soul clarence took a chair by his aunt's side and prepared to hear her story with an earnest but mournful attention his aunt then related to him the particulars of the dreadful conspiracy which had been devised by herself the late sir henry courtenay and mr torrens against the honour of rosamond and clarence now learnt for the first time that mr torrens had only consented to his marriage with adele in order to get them both out of the way so that the younger sister might be completely in the power of those who had thus leagued against her happiness and her virtue although i deplore that such motives should have been the favouring circumstances which led to my union with adele said clarence yet i rejoice that my charming and adored wife is safely removed by the fact of that marriage from the power of such a monster of a parent mrs torrens sighed profoundly and then entered upon those details which explained to her nephew how she became acquainted with mr torrens the whole particulars of the murder of sir henry courtenay as she herself had heard them from the lips of mr torrens the forgery of the check to which crime that individual was privy the way in which she had compelled him to marry her and the flight of howard the attorney with the produce of the crime for which she was now in a felon's jail and you believe that mr torrens is really innocent of the black deed imputed to him said clarence inquiringly for he was now anxious to ascertain whether the tale which he had just heard in explanation of that mysterious event would correspond with the proclamation of mr torrens innocence which was to be that day made to the world according to the assurances given on the preceding morning by esther de medina i am confident that the account given by mr torrens in which i have now related to you is correct answered mrs torrens for she added after a few moments hesitation when once we understood each other when once our hands were united there was no necessity to maintain any secrets from each other we plunged headlong into crime hand in hand and felt no shame in each other's presence besides he had no motive to perpetrate such a deed on the contrary he deprived himself of a friend whose purse was most useful to him true observed clarence struck by the truth of this reasoning in respect to myself resumed the unhappy woman i have made up my mind how to act i shall not aggravate my enormity by denial i shall plead guilty to the charge of forgery and without implicating that wretched man on whom the charge of murder now presses with such a fearful weight of circumstantial evidence no i shall not mention him in connection with that deed of mine so that if he escape from the cruel difficulty in which he is now placed no other accusations beyond those of his own conscience may injure his peace you have determined to adopt the course which i should have counselled said clarence it would be useless to attempt the defence of that which is so clearly apparent the forged signature had not the baronet's private mark attached to it but the clerk who cashed it for you did not think of scrutinising it so closely at the moment as you were well known to him a subsequent examination of it proved the forgery stands not the case so at least it was thus reported in the newspapers the statement is correct answered mrs torrens mournfully and i feel convinced that i shall possess a greater chance of obtaining the royal mercy by pleading guilty at once and confessing my error oh to escape death a premature death a horrible death she cried suddenly becoming nervously excited again compose yourself aunt compose yourself exclaimed clarence for you have an act of justice to do towards an innocent man in a word i wish you to sign the account of the murder of sir henry courtenay as you received it from the lips of mr torrens and as you have now related it to me i will draw it up briefly and no one can tell of what benefit the existence of such a document may prove to your unhappy husband clarence hastened to procure writing materials from the governor's office and on his return to the parlour he drew up the statement combining it with a confession of the forgery 
though not mentioning the name of Mr. Torrens in connection with that latter crime. The penitent woman then signed the paper in a firm handwriting, and it immediately appeared as if a load were taken from her mind. Villiers now informed her that Rosamond had found an asylum, some kind friends of the Jewish persuasion, but faithful to his promise to Esther de Medina, he did not drop even so much as a hint of the hopes which that admirable young lady had held out with regard to the expected proclamation and the existing proofs of Mr. Torrens's innocence. It struck him, however, that the paper which she had that moment received from his aunt might assist the steps that were in such mysterious progress elsewhere to remove from the head of his father-in-law the dreadful charge which rested upon it. "'I must leave you now, aunt,' said the young man, rising from his seat. "'Shall you visit Mr. Torrens?' she inquired, in a hesitating manner. "'Not to-day,' was the answer. The prison regulations do not permit visitors to call on the same inmate of this jail two days consecutively. In fact, for I abhor everything savoring of duplicity, I will candidly inform you that Adelaide, myself, Rosamond, and the young lady with whom that poor girl is staying saw Mr. Torrens yesterday. You visited him first, murmured the wretched woman. But I do not blame you. I cannot reproach you, Clarence, she added hastily. It was natural that your wife should wish to see her father, and equally natural that you should accompany her. Besides, I know that it must have cost you a painful effort to enter the presence of one so stained with crime, so polluted, so infamous as I. Your contrition has obliterated from my mind all feelings save those of regret and commiseration, returned Clarence warmly. Would that justice could so easily forget the past as I oh i thank you for those generous assurances exclaimed mrs torrens bursting into tears for sympathy in such a place as this is dearer to the soul than all the enjoyments which the great world outside could possibly bestow the kind word ay and what is more the word of forgiveness is the holy dew of heaven for years and years clarence was i a vile hypocrite and such sentences as those flowed glibly from my tongue, because they were the means whereby I deceived the world. But now, oh, now I feel all I say, and whatever may be my doom, I shall at last appreciate the sublime truths of that religion which I so long used as a mask. Clarence, she added in a more measured tone, always suspect the individual who makes the display of his religion. Be assured that true religious feelings do not obtrude themselves in all unseasonable moments upon society. The man or the woman who enacts the part of a saint is nothing more nor less than a despicable hypocrite, and I believe that more flagacy is concealed beneath such a mask as I so long wore than can possibly exist amongst those who make no outward display of religion. But I will not detain you longer. I know that Adelaide must be cruelly shocked by all that has lately happened. One word, however, before we part. You will not, you cannot acquaint her with, with, with the ruin of Rosamond? cried Clarence, seeing that his aunt hesitated. Oh, no, no, it would kill my poor wife. Not for worlds would I allow her to learn that dreadful secret. But now I understand full well wherefore Rosamond preferred to remain with her new friends, rather than accompany her sister and myself. Mrs. Torrens and Clarence embraced and separated, the former returning to her ward in company with the matron, who had waited in an adjacent room during this interview, and the latter repairing to the office of the governor, to whom he handed the document which his aunt had signed. The young man then proceeded to the house of some friends dwelling in the city, and with whom he had left Adelaide during his visit to Newgate. We should observe that he was fully enabled thus to dispose of his time, according to his own will, he having obtained six weeks' leave of absence from the government office to which he belonged. In the course of the morning, he called at the lodgings which he had occupied in Bridge Street, Blackfriars, previously to his marriage with Adelaide, to see if there were any letters lying there for him. There was only one, and the contents of that ran as follows. Pall Mall West. 
the earl of ellingham presents his compliments to mr villiers and requests that mr villiers will on his return to town favor the earl with an interview relative to private business of some importance there must assuredly be some mistake in this observed clarence as he showed the letter to adelaide for i am totally unacquainted with this nobleman and cannot understand what private business he can possibly have to transact with me however i will call to-morrow or next day and ascertain the point when the excitement connected with your father's situation shall have somewhat subsided by the declaration of his innocence we need hardly say that clarence had communicated to his beloved wife the fact that his aunt had narrated to him the particulars of the manner in which sir henry courtenay came by his death and that he had drawn up the narrative which upon being signed by her had been deposited in the hands of the governor of newgate end of section 101 recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 102 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Sir Christopher Blunt, a hero. It was about midday when an extraordinary rumour began to spread like wildfire throughout the metropolis. The report was that between ten and eleven o'clock that morning, Sir Christopher Blunt and Dr. Lascelles had presented themselves to the sitting magistrate at Bow Street, and had not only communicated to that functionary a surprising account of certain adventures which had happened to themselves, but had likewise placed in his hands a document which proclaimed the innocence of mr torrens who was lying in newgate under an accusation of murder the adventures alluded to were of such an amazing character that had they been related by persons of a less honourable reputation than sir christopher blunt and dr lascelles they would have been treated as a pure invention on the part either of maniacs or unprincipled friends of the accused but the known integrity of those two gentlemen gave no scope for even the slightest breath of suspicion, and their tale, though wonderful, was so consistent in all its parts that it was received as one of those truths which are stranger than fiction. The entire metropolis was in amazement. Two respectable gentlemen, an eminent physician and a wealthy justice of the peace, had been conducted, blindfolded, to a house where they had received the depositions of two men who confessed themselves to be the murderers of the late sir henry courtenay there was no appearance of fraud in that confession the men had been cross-examined apart and had agreed in the minutest details every one therefore believed that mr torrens was indeed innocent and the city magistrate at bow street expressed the same opinion but who was the individual that had caused sir christopher blunt and dr Lascelles? to be thus made the recipients of the confession of the murderers where was the house to which those gentlemen had been taken what motive was there for screening the assassins why was so much mystery observed in the entire transaction and wherefore had sir christopher and the physician been enjoined to withhold the publication of the matter for twenty-four hours after its occurrence these questions were in everybody's mouth but no one could suggest anything resembling even the shadow of a satisfactory solution. The weapon with which the crime had been perpetrated, and a portion of the proceeds of the robbery effected at Torrens Cottage, at the same time, accompanied the depositions placed by Sir Christopher Blunt in the hands of the magistrate, and a surgeon, on examining the corpse which had been removed to the deceased's house previous to receiving the rites of Christian burial, declared that the throat must have been cut by such an instrument as the one thus produced but this was not all the moment the rumour of what had occurred at bow street reached the prison of newgate the governor hastened to the police office and submitted to the magistrate the confession made that morning by mrs torrens this confession not only admitted her guilt in respect to the forgery but gave such a version of the murder 
as completely tallied with the depositions made by Timothy Splint and Joshua Pedler. Looking at the entire case as it thus stood, there was no doubt of the innocence of Mr. Torrens, and all that gentleman's friends, who, by the by, had hitherto kept aloof from him, crowded to Newgate to congratulate him on the facts which had transpired. The sensation created by the affair throughout the capital was tremendous, and when the evening papers were published, the copies were greedily caught up in all directions. It was a fine harvest for those journalists, and their sale that day was prodigious. An individual often spoken of, but never yet seen, namely the oldest inhabitant in the metropolis, was duly mentioned on the occasion. Never, said each of the evening papers, as if the reporters had all been suddenly struck by the same idea, never within the memory of the oldest inhabitant of the metropolis has so extraordinary a case transpired. And certainly no event for many years had produced such a powerful excitement, animating even the most callous and indifferent dispositions with a desire to know more, and setting a thinking many who had quite enough in their own affairs to occupy all their thoughts. The taverns, public houses, and coffee shops became the scenes of loud and interesting discussions, but even the knowing ones found no opportunity of displaying their sagacity, for the mystery of the whole affair positively defied conjecture. But who can the man be that is at the bottom of all this, and where can his residence be situated? were the questions which every tongue uttered, and to which no one could reply. That such an extraordinary incident should occur in the metropolis, without leaving the faintest trace or the smallest clue to the elucidation of the enigma, appeared almost incredible. As for Sir Christopher Blunt, he certainly did not appear to know whether he stood upon his head or his heels. The Home Secretary sent for him in the course of the afternoon, and received from his lips a full and complete statement of the whole occurrence. For the government was naturally indignant that any individual should unwarrantably usurp the functions of the proper authorities by holding murderers in their own custody, and adopting his own course to prove the innocence of a man in the grasp of justice. Sir Christopher was, however, unable to afford the slightest information which was likely to lead to the discovery of that individual, or of his place of abode. On his return to his own house in Jermyn Street, Sir Christopher found several noblemen and influential gentlemen, including three or four members of Parliament, waiting to see him and he instantly became the lion of the company. No pen can describe the immense pomposity with which he repeated his narrative of the mysterious transaction. No words can convey an idea of the immeasurable conceit and self-sufficiency with which he described the cross-examination of the murderers. In fact, the knight made himself so busy in the matter, was so accessible to all visitors who were anxious to gratify their curiosity, by asking a thousand questions, and was so ready to afford the newspaper reporters all the information which he had to impart respecting the incident, that no one thought of applying to Dr. Lascelles in a similar manner. This circumstance was the more agreeable to the physician, inasmuch as he not only disliked wasting his time in gossip, but he was well pleased at escaping the necessity of giving vague answers or positive denials in an affair the details of which were in reality no mystery to him. To all his visitors Sir Christopher Blunt took care to speak in the following terms. You see, the individual who is the prime mover in this most extraordinary proceeding required the assistance of no ordinary magistrate. He wanted a man of keen penetration, the most perfect business habits, and the highest character, a man, in a word, who would probe the very souls of the two miscreants to be placed before him and on whose report the world could implicitly rely. That was the reason wherefore I was pitched upon as the justice of the peace best qualified to undertake so difficult a business. Sir Christopher became a perfect hero, as the mysterious stranger had predicted, and during the remainder of that memorable day on which the innocence of Mr. Torrens was proclaimed, Jermyn Street was literally lined with carriages, the common destination being the night's abode so that a stranger in the metropolis would have supposed that such a scene of animation 
and excitement could only be occasioned by the arrival of some great foreign prince or that the prime minister lived in that house and was holding a levee when all sir christopher's visitors had retired and he found himself alone in his drawing-room at about half-past ten that evening he threw himself on a sofa exclaiming aloud egad that old fellow who knocked down the irish captain and afterwards turned out to be a young man was quite right i am a hero a regular hero this popularity is truly delightful i really do not envy the duke of wellington his having won the battle of waterloo no indeed not i sir christopher blunt is a greater man than his grace although only a knight scarcely had the worthy gentleman arrived at this very satisfactory conclusion when mr lickspittal entered the room holding his portfolio in his hand and bowing so low at every third step which he took in advancing towards the knight that it really seemed as if he were anxious to ascertain how close to the floor he could put his nose without rolling completely over like the clown at astley's my revered patron began mr lickspittal i have taken the liberty of bringing the first half-dozen pages of the manuscript of the pamphlet the deuce take the pamphlet mr lipskittle shouted sir christopher leaping from the sofa and in the exuberance of his joy kicking the portfolio from the literary gentleman's hands up to the ceiling so that the papers all showered down upon the head of their author who stood amazed and aghast at this singular reception but in the next moment it struck the discomfited mr lickspittal that sir christopher blunt had suddenly taken leave of his senses or in other words had gone raving mad and he rushed to the door stop stop cried sir christopher darting after him what the deuce is the matter with the man no don't don't injure me roared mr lickspittal falling upon his knees as the knight caught him by the arm injure you my good fellow exclaimed sir christopher surveying him with the utmost amazement what could possibly put such a thing into your head i'm not angry with you i'm only mad i know you are cried mr lickspittal in a tone of horror while his countenance expressed the most ludicrous alarm yes mad literally mad insane my dear fellow vociferated sir christopher quitting his hold upon the literary gentleman and absolutely dancing round him oh lord oh lord groaned mr lickspittal still upon his knees and nailed by terror to the spot insane mad with joy cried the knight but get up and don't be frightened i am not angry with you but i suppose that the idea of entering the presence of a man like me is too much for you my poor fellow added sir christopher stopping short in the midst of his capering antics and surveying the literary gentleman with immense commiseration oh only mad with joy murmured mr lickspittal considerably relieved by the assurance and starting to his feet then dexterously catching at the suspicion which sir christopher in his boundless self-conceit had expressed the literary gentleman suddenly resumed his usual cringing manner and said in a tone of deep veneration pardon me my excellent patron if for a moment overcome by your presence the presence of a man whose name is upon every tongue say no more about it my good fellow cried the knight with all the bland condescension of a patron to tell you the truth i am quite beside myself with joy and i should not expose myself thus to any one save yourself you are however a privileged person behind the scenes as it were and you know how necessary popularity is to me egad mr lickspittal i little thought when i began life as a poor boy that i should one day become a great a very great meekly suggested the sycophant a very great man added sir christopher emphatically as he surveyed himself in a neighbouring mirror i tell you what mr lickspittal those vulgar citizens of port Socon must now be ready to cut their throats a person did expire in that ward very suddenly to-day sir christopher observed the literary gentleman drawing upon his imagination for this little incident which he knew would prove most welcome to the knight's vanity and there's every reason to suppose that his death was caused by vexation no doubt of it exclaimed the justice of the peace playing with his shirt frill don't you see that there will now be no necessity for the pamphlets 
here mr lickspittle's countenance fell but you shall write instead continued the knight a complete narrative of my most romantic and extraordinary adventures here mr lickspittle's countenance brightened up again no you shan't though cried his patron an idea striking him again the sycophant's brow became overcast you shall write the history of my life added sir christopher and again the literary gentleman's brow expanded yes yes the life and times suggested mr lickspittle the life and times of sir christopher blunt exclaimed the knight triumphantly in three volumes large octavo with portraits added the sycophant egad that's a capital suggestion of yours the portraits i mean said sir christopher but you must show that although i began the world with nothing yet i am of an ancient and highly respectable family certainly my dear sir there was no doubt of blunt at crecy or agincourt observed mr lickspittle at all events it is easy to say there was and in a note put see manuscripts british museum that is the way we always manage in such cases my dear sir christopher the british museum is a most convenient place what to write in asked the justice of the peace no sir to furnish pedigrees for those who haven't got any ah i understand cried sir christopher chuckling capital capital well my good fellow set about the life and times directly but by the by i wish the work to begin something in this way it was on a dark and tempestiferous night the wind roared the artillery flew in fitting gusts the streaming shafts of electricity shot across the eccentric sky and so on that's a pretty sentence you perceive and being entirely my own composition striking me in fact at the moment and not suggested by any other person it does you infinite credit sir christopher interrupted mr lickspittle with an obsequious bow and with a little correction oh, of course you will use your discretion well now we understand each other mr lickspittle and you will begin the work immediately of course you must introduce a great quantity of correspondence between myself and the leading men of this age but who are now all dead have you such letters by you sir inquired the literary gentleman not i ejaculated sir christopher blunt speaking bluntly indeed oh that's no matter i can easily invent some observed mr lickspittle i thank you most sincerely for your kind your generous patronage my dear sir christopher in fact i can never forget it i i and mr lickspittle by way of working his sycophancy up to the highest possible pitch or shall we not say down to the lowest degree of self-abasement affected to burst into tears and rushed from the room poor fellow he's quite overcome by his feelings murmured sir christopher to himself that's what i call real gratitude now and having mused upon this and divers other matters for some few minutes the worthy knight went upstairs to see his affectionate spouse and the baby ere he retired to his own apartment End of section 102